Okay, thanks uh, to the organizers of today's event. I'm excited to uh, share with everyone today about our work in developing uh, an affordable housing platform in the Bay Area and how I myself, along with the rest of my team, uh, worked in a way where we uh, actively did a lot of community outreach with our community partners uh, to make a product that was accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Uh, let's see, sorry. So uh, one question I try to ask myself as a designer and a member of a, of a team that delivers products that have social impact is sort of like, you know, how do we build our products to be accessible for all users? Um, we, at Exigy, uh, we're a B Corporation. And so uh, the products that we take on, on a regular basis are products that are targeted to serving uh, marginalized communities in some way and, and, and delivering uh, in a way that uh, they're creating positive change in people's lives. And so one aspect of that is making sure that those, those products uh, deliver and are uh, usable by people with disabilities. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm gonna talk about one project that we have done in the last uh, six years um, and how that project grew and how that project allowed us as a team to establish an accessibility playbook that we use across all of our products. Uh, and it was because of how deep this product went into working with the community members, it allowed us to really test a lot of things and kind of get beyond what you might do if you just kind of do a Google search about accessibility and actually talk to real people about the kinds of solutions and the kinds of things that are really gonna help them. So, yeah, so just a little bit about the product. Uh, XG has been working with various communities uh, for the past, again, uh, five years to build a one-stop shop uh, for housing related needs. And there's four pieces to the product that we've developed. Uh, it centralizes affordable housing resources uh, so that there's one place you go for all affordable housing listings. Uh, it makes the application process as uh, easy and equitable as possible to as many people as possible. And on the developer side of things, the housing developer side, it makes their process of managing that experience for the applicants as smooth as possible while reducing costs and kind of taking a look at some existing third party tools that they're already using and, and kind of complementing those workflows. Um, and finally, we started in San Francisco, we moved into San Mateo County, San Jose and Alameda. And in that process, uh, are collecting a lot of data about a lot of people and, and, and feeding that to the region so that uh, the Bay Area in general and California is getting smarter about the kinds of housing opportunities that people actually need uh, and, and, and not keeping that knowledge bucketed in one county, one region in, in California. Uh, so again, just to step back, just do a little bit more storytelling around the housing product before we get into the accessibility work was, um, so we started in 2016, we worked with the San Francisco Mayor's Office uh, of Affordable uh, Housing and Community Development uh, to take a look at a product or a process uh, that was on paper that was being done a dozen different ways by dozens of different agencies and was really opaque and, and people really didn't have access. And it was just really hard for somebody who needed affordable housing to find a valid opportunity for a unit that was available and submit their application, find out if they were accepted and what happens next. And so we took that very uh, distributed, uh, you know, decentralized process and made it a purely digital process that folks could do in 20 minutes. They could, they could log on, uh, choose to create an account or not create an account and apply for uh, an affordable housing opportunity. Um, and then since its inception, the site's been vastly popular uh, and in San Francisco alone has gotten, you know, 5 million folks uh, have been served. And then uh, over uh, 100 households uh, per month are actually being housed in affordable uh, housing units uh, because of the portal there. 
Uh, since 2017, based on the success in San Francisco, uh, we developed relationships in San Mateo County and San Jose and Alameda County and found that we kind of had to take some of the policies and decisions that were made in one jurisdiction in one county and go out and knock on a lot of doors and meet a lot of people and have a lot of conversations again about how their data model and how they and their public policy around housing and affordable housing, how that fit and compared with the work we did in San Francisco so that we could make a solution that everybody could use. Um, and then develop a code base that is open source that uh, we now have folks in Detroit and are talking with people across the country about how to kind of set up uh, Bloom code bases uh, in, in any number of locations uh, across the country. So, so that's a bit about the product, um, but the stuff that I think we're here to talk about today is accessibility, right? And so one thing that I found, I did a, a lot of the user testing and user research for this project in the first few years. And at the sort of like most rapid uh, state of user testing, we were out there every two weeks, uh, sitting down with veterans, uh, people with disabilities, uh, homeless and their homeless people, uh, just various uh, communities, non-English speakers, uh, and, and finding out how they were going to use a website in order to accomplish a task, right? And I think the thing that you find out, especially about housing, is it's a very, uh, it's a very human issue, right? It's a, people, it puts, it's a, puts people in a very vulnerable place when they're trying to find a, a place to to house their family. And so it, it uh, left us with the, the, you know, the, the principle that we needed to be very intentional about the decisions that we were making. And we really needed to maintain you know, ongoing relationships with the people that we were trying to design solutions for. Um, and as part of that work, uh, we developed a set of accessibility standards that now all of the products at Exigy uh, try to uh, base their you know, work on both design and engineering and in content uh, design, like the actual words that you read and, uh, and make that accessible, uh, you know, accessible for everybody. Um, and we'll kind of talk about this in a little bit is that the work that you do in design and technology to make something accessible to somebody with a disability is actually just making your product better. It's, it's applying structure, it's applying semantics, it's applying uh, just like intuitive best practices to your product. And by serving folks who are traditionally underserved, you're actually making some of the, something that's easier and easier to use by everybody. And so uh, I'm not sure, uh, Hopefully a lot of this isn't redundant, but we we'll get into like a definition of accessibility or how we define accessibility in the communities that we serve with some of our um, design and technical solutions. Uh, there's four categories of uh, user and community that we focus on when designing uh, for accessibility, visual, hearing, physical, and cognitive. There's a wide range of ability to disability across that spectrum. It could be somebody who's just nearsighted or farsighted to severe or somebody who's completely blind. Uh, and the solutions that we put in place seek to serve as wide a range as possible of, of those people. Um, and when it comes to the types of solutions that we're, we're looking for, just some numbers, 28% uh, of the world's population has some sort of uh, you know, visual uh, impairment that's going to be benefit from accessibility uh, uh, solutions. 5% um, of the world's population has some sort of hearing uh, impairment that's gonna benefit from these uh, things that we're doing. 16% uh, of adults in the US have some type of physical uh, impairment uh, that's gonna benefit. And finally, like 8 million people in the US uh, have uh, some uh, form of cognitive dis disability that's gonna benefit. And the types of solutions change uh, based on the community that you're seeking to serve or your product may focus on a specific silo of this community. I don't think 
there's a rule that says you, you have to equally serve all of these folks and based on <clears throat> your user research and the people you're trying to serve, you may need to prioritize different uh, aspects of, of this overall uh, ecosystem. But the types of solutions are, are different for, for each use case. And for visual, we're looking at contrast and structure. So text size, text weight, uh, color combinations. And then on the structure side of things, uh, pr a predictable layout, clear uh, hierarchy, and making sure content is scalable. Th those kinds of things are all gonna serve folks with uh, visual impairments. Uh, uh, when it comes to hearing, uh, anytime you can pair audio with any kind of feedback you're getting in the browser is gonna assist that community. And when it comes to physical disabilities, uh, you're looking at operability, meaning that um, not these folks aren't using your standard mouse and keyboard uh, solutions. They're using assistive technology to access your products and your websites. And so this, whatever you come up with uh, needs, needs to meet that uh, criteria. And finally, when it comes to cognitive disabilities, uh, the, the kinds of things you want to be looking for uh, to solve problems are organizing your content, a strong hierarchy, highlighting focus where somebody is on the page, and just clear and simple tasks. Breaking out long tasks <clears throat> into simple step-by-step -step processes are going to reduce the cognitive load on somebody who's trying to access uh, your service. And like I, I mentioned earlier, accessibility helps everybody. The, the types of things that you're gonna put in place to make your website serve uh, people with disabilities are gonna serve more and more people. For example, if I have a slow internet connection, uh, my content is gonna load before my CSS loads, right? So I'm just gonna get like structured text on the page. And if I take my time as a designer and a developer, to make sure I've structured my content with clear headings, the somebody is still gonna be able to get the gist of the content, right? They're still gonna be able to accomplish a task. So those things that we put in place to assist somebody with a cognitive disability are gonna help somebody who just has bad internet. Uh, situational limitations, such as uh, anytime your senses or your, or, are compromised, such as like bright sunlight or like being in a loud environment, those tools that we put in place for people with visual impairments or hearing impairments are going to help you when you're just in your car and and the and or you know and and the sun's really bright right so so those things are gonna are gonna help more and more people and finally temporary disabilities everybody breaks a finger an arm or loses their glasses or breaks their glasses and in those instances those things we've put in place with people for visual impairments and for those people with uh, physical disabilities, they're gonna come and be useful at those times. And finally, with alternative devices, uh, smart watches or, or TVs, like, like when your screen is being stretched really big or shrunk really small, and when I just don't have a mouse, if you put into place keyboard accessibility, which we'll get into in a second, which allows you to scan your content, those devices are going to pick up on that and all of a sudden you have a website that's accessible on alternate devices because you prioritize meeting the needs of, of somebody uh, who needs to use a keyboard. So again, I, I wanted to sort of take a minute to kind of look at some of the more like technical stuff that we do as uh, sort of a checklist uh, that we have in, when we kick off projects and as we work on projects uh, that serves as our baseline of accessibility. Um, we, like most folks, you know, base the work that we do on the web content accessibility guidelines in section 508 and four big things that make our kind of, you know, front line of uh, accessibility are keyboard access. All interactions on that website, you know, need to be available via, you know, arrows and tab keys and, and the space bar. And it's not that everybody has a keyboard. It's because assistive technology devices are programmed to use those inputs to do the things that they need to do. So the keyboard is the way that we're testing those inputs, but those inputs are being leveraged by more complex technology uh, and helping people uh, with, with physical disabilities. Uh, and then when it comes to text hierarchy, 
also really critical, really sort of like front of mind for us is the example I talked about before is like really making sure your content is structured in a way where your H1 becomes before your H2, before your H3, and that content is really nested appropriately. If you've ever seen uh, a person use a cell phone who's using a screen reader, they can choose the different kinds of ways that they scan content. You can either scan by scanning the links on a page or you can scan by text. And it's the same way you read the outline or table of contents of a document. So they're gonna scan your content and get a gist of the types of content that you have on your page, find the content that they want, and then, and then select that section of content and read more. So, but in order for that to work properly, you need to do the work to make sure your headings are nested appropriately for that to happen. Um, next up is forms. Most of the things that we do every day on the internet involve some kind of form, email sign up, or more complex registration forms. And there's all kinds of things that you can do to make sure that your forms are reachable, tabable by the keyboard. And then when something goes wrong, uh, when there's an error, a user needs to know something went wrong and what to do to fix it. And they might not be able to see your screen. And so you need to be able to use the proper ARIA labeling and form conventions to make sure that any instructions or error messages connect to that form input so that person doesn't get lost or trapped and they can fix something and move through your website the same, the same way that somebody who has the benefit of sight can also make that make that um, change based on the error messages you probably have on your website. And then finally, the last thing that sort of like is kind of crucial to, to make sure we reach as many people as possible is color contrast. And this, there are lots of tools that do this. Uh, your visual designers can do this really early on just to make sure the color combinations that they're using uh, have sufficient contrast to push the text away from your backgrounds. There are automated tools you can use uh, in your development environment to make sure this is done consistently. And there's even new CSS properties that you can, you can do uh, or you can apply to your HTML and your styles so that if this stuff gets changed dynamically, uh, your website can be smart enough to change the color so that there's sufficient contrast ratio based on uh, whatever dynamic event happened in the browser. So all, all of that stuff is very boilerplate and very sort of baseline for us to get started. Um, I did want to touch on how accessibility kind of grows into other, into other ways of meeting the needs of people. Uh, accessibility has been around for a long time and I think it's sort of grown into this idea of inclusive design. And inclusive design is an umbrella term uh, where you're, you're making sure that the solutions you're coming up with and the problems that you're solving are, are meeting a full range of human diversity. And that, and that means uh, meeting the needs of people who might otherwise be marginalized or underserved. Uh, one example of that that's fairly straightforward is language access, right? <clears throat> so if you're trying to meet the needs of more and more people, uh, uh, making sure that your content and your website and your forms are accessible uh, to non-English speakers or monolingual users is, is critical. Uh, it's something that we learned a lot about on the, in the housing world. Uh, you had a lot of people who are uh, either work, you're traditionally working with housing counselors who are uh, who speak or, or speak their language, uh, but we wanted to make sure that our tool did a lot of those things. Um, one big consideration what is that each jurisdiction in the Bay Area prioritizes different communities. So San Francisco has four languages that it serves by default. Alameda County actually has a subtly different set of languages, and we, we're seeing that each county, based on its constituency is gonna change the, the, the communities that it prioritizes and serves. And so we, we built the system to ensure that that happens. Uh, we use a combination of manual uh, translations where we actually hire a, a person to come in and translate the copy uh, for, for static text, text that's common across all the listings. There's uh, all housing policy, but from listing to listing, things change. 
And so we can't always get a manual translation in time for a listing uh, to go up. So we use Google Translate in those instances uh, to fill in the gaps so that we have uh, some baseline of, of language translation happening. Um, and for all of that, it's not perfect, right? Even if we have somebody who comes in and translates this based on the dictionary definition of the word, there's a lot of context like that is subtle when it comes to language translation. And the dictionary definition translation doesn't always work. So what we've had to do is continue to reach out to housing counselors who serve these communities and have them read through our text to make sure that within the housing context and within the, that, that these terms still apply and that we are using the appropriate ones. And so it's, a, it's an iterative process uh, that we're consistently learning and having those partners in the community uh, just act as one more uh, fail safe uh, to make sure that we don't alienate anybody or sort of push anybody out. Um, so having those relationships is really critical for us. Uh, being on the ground with you with users and maintaining partnerships and I'll just sort of overview uh, what that process looks like uh, in the beginning we we have these folks that we work with represent these different communities either language based or ability based communities and we sit down with them really early on and we ask them in broad strokes is what we're thinking of really going to solve the problem and they've kind of let us know what what works and what doesn't work then our, our visual designers uh, have an idea and they start to sketch it out. And they're using uh, visual accessibility tools such as color contrast uh, in the design mockups to make sure that we have sufficient like visual contrast. That moves over to the product team and the product team writes the stories for the engineering team to build. And they're gonna put the accessibility criteria into the user story. Like based on the W3C, uh, they're actually gonna put in like what this component needs to do in the browser and how a keyboard user is gonna access this component so that when the developer picks it up, it's very explicit to them what they need to do, right? They're signing a contract to make this component as accessible as possible. The developer and the engineer have automated tools that they're using to parse the code that they're writing just to make sure that it's like linted and, and uh, we use a tool called Axe, which, uh, make sure all of our components are meeting that same checklist of accessibility. Uh, but even technology again has its limits. And so we have to do manual QA browsing after the fact and need to keyboard test everything. And, but, and then we have to have another step where we actually reach out to the community members who use these tools every day to make sure that we're not professional screen reader users. We don't know really all the nuances of JAWS and, and voiceover. We need people who use this stuff to tell us. And then there's another step where they feed that feedback back. And so two relationships that we built in San Francisco that were super useful. Uh, one was in, with White House for the Blind. Um, we, we met them through with the mayor's office and uh, they worked with us from the beginning again in that first state. They were just there to kind of look at our broad strokes uh, like plan and tell us the kinds of things that we needed to be aware of when, when, when serving people with, with uh, visual impairments. Uh, we next sat down with experts on their team. They actually have people at White House whose job it is to test websites and test apps and make sure that they work uh, for people. And uh, we got a, really, a lot of really great feedback from them early on, especially around our short form application. We had a lot of error messages that weren't working. We had some keyboard trapped where people were getting lost. And they really helped us like get rid of those traps to make sure that everybody could use that application. And then as the, the features matured, we continued to work with them. And they have a program actually at Lighthouse, which is really cool, where they actually train young people to become accessibility experts. So they, they are training people who have visual impairments to become professional accessibility experts so they can be paid to, be, to use the technology they use every day to ensure products are more and more accessible to more people. So that was, that was a pretty yeah, rewarding process. And then finally, we met with the ARC in San Francisco who serves uh, uh, families uh, with members with developmental disabilities and cognitive disabilities. And they gave us three big principles that we, we use throughout the application and the website. One is to make everything clear and simple. Uh, we have a, a short form application 
uh, that we, we break up into steps and they encouraged us to take any time there was a complex question to really pare that down to where somebody only has to think about like a yes or no option because you know people with cognitive disabilities really need to focus on one task at a time. Uh, they continually encouraged us to readdress the reading level uh, to make sure that the text was as clear as possible and was, was just enough to get the job done. And then finally, empty space, which might seem simple, but the more you provide space around your interfaces and allow people to focus on one task or one button or one form element at a time is less daunting, right? It allows people to kind of get, get the things done they need to get done. And, and so the general impact uh, of, of the platform has been pretty, pretty nice to see. And I think we credit a lot of that with the accessibility uh, uh, changes that we made. We have, you know, reached 600,000 online applications. We have a uh, 97 plus percentile when it comes to applying online versus applying via paper. And again, uh, you know, having 5 million folks uh, in San Francisco alone uh, be able to use the product is, is a great milestone. Um, so just in, in summary, some of the things that really uh, helped us and make, make us a better product team and we credit were uh, three, three pieces, being accessible from the start, really developing relationships with partners and experts in this stuff and co-owning these decisions, testing with real people and not relying solely on technology to make these decisions for you. And then building into your process, like I showed you before, making sure that every member of your team carries some of this burden and that nobody's the bottleneck is really going to ensure that uh, there's less stress in your team. Uh, this becomes kind of a principle or an ideal everybody's using. And it's something that sort of at the end of the day, uh, you can all uh, put, put, a, put a pin in. Um, I can share this link. Uh, if anybody's interested, I put together just sort of like a set of resources uh, that anybody can use uh, to make, to foster more inclusive design in their products. Uh, there's six pieces of this and it's not just accessibility. Uh, there are tools out there such as the web AIM has a keyboard access instructions, how you as a person who doesn't use a screen reader can do all the testing via keyboard to ensure that people with screen readers can use your, your product. A color contrast tool that allows you to input any two colors and gives you a grade on those colors. Uh, uh, Google has a page speed test tool where you can put your URL in there and it'll tell you uh, how well you're serving people uh, with limited bandwidth. So you're reaching more and more people. Um, uh, Flesh Kincaid has a readability tool where you can put in a URL and they give you back a score for your, uh, the complexity of the, the text that you're, you're communicating to your, your visitors. Um, Intuit, this is, this is more progressive. Intuit has actually taken a step further and, uh, and promotes, and as we do as well, uh, uh, moving towards anti-racist vocabulary in your products, moving away from a lot of uh, you know, terms that were invented in the past that actually cause more harm than good, and uh, moving towards uh, more inclusive language to broaden your audience. And then finally, a digital literacy is this idea that just good intuitive design practices uh, can help people who might be intimidated by technology, who might have cognitive disabilities. Uh, and there are things you can do just as a designer when planning how to build something. And there's, some, there's a resource there for folks to use as well. Um, please feel free to reach out, uh, give us an email. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about the housing project, or you can reach out to us um, on social media. Uh, if you have any other questions. Well, thank you so much, Jesse.